Well, we're joined now by a man who at 21 left his home in Sweden to pursue an assignment that he knew God had given him to reach the unreached in Africa. He's here to share some of his inspiring experiences, which he's also highlighted in the book, The Assignment, Journey to the Extreme. His name is Carl Hargestam. Carl, welcome to 100 Huntley Street and to Canada. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> it's very good to be here today. Well, there's a, there's a lot we want to talk about and there's some exciting things that you're involved with, but let's back up a bit because uh, at the age of 18, before your assignment, you uh, had an experience that just kind of changed everything for you. Maybe talk about that. You know, I think that um, I, I had the privilege to uh, be introduced uh, to Christ. I was uh, fairly young. Uh, and saved and kind of walked with that and understanding of having something more, uh, uh, a, a greater purpose in my life. But you know, so many times you drift, you get caught up in things. And for me, that was a journey that lasted kind of through my teens. And, and it was uh, not until uh, 18, I, I was with a friend uh, and uh, you know, we kind of liked fast cars at that time. So he had a, he had a brand new Porsche and this was in Stockholm, Sweden. And we, I got in and uh, with him as a passenger, uh, no seatbelts, and he was just driving real fast. Mm -hmm. So, uh, I, you know, maybe it, at uh, 80, 90 miles an hour, he ro rolled the car wow. uh, in the city, and, and, uh, and um, I was thrown out of this car, landed, uh, he rendered me unconscious, and I was in the hospital, and I had an encounter there with the Lord where I felt like it was not that I had to choose to be saved or life and death. My decision was, you know, am I going to accept the assignment God has for my life? It really was. Wow. So that changed everything for you, put you on a path, mm -hmm. a whole new direction. Be yeah. Beginning of an adventure that I, I had no idea. You know what? I, I didn't say yes to go to Africa. I didn't say yes to so many times we make it this mystical thing. And I, mm -hmm. what I said yes to is not my plans, your plans. Uh -huh. So then at 21, mm -hmm. the plans became a little bit more clear and uh, talk about this assignment time. You know, uh, I, I, in fact, uh, after I, I did this, uh, the accident there, I ended up fairly quickly in Africa and I was serving, serv serving the Swedish mission at that uh -huh. time and uh, many questions. I was just kind of helping, but uh, um, I, I had this uh, vision that the Lord just really kind of came to me in defining what I felt this is really what the Lord wants me to do. From uh, the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 24, verse 14. And the Lord is speaking to me and He's, yeah, he's dealing to, uh, with me uh, in what I believe. And, you know, people who have different beliefs. But I certainly had this overwhelming feeling that uh, we're living in the last days. And uh, Jesus gave one assignment to His disciples. That was to make disciples of all nations, every tribe, language, people, and nation. And I felt the Lord speak to me and say, I want you to give your life for that assignment. Mm -hmm. That's not finished yet. Matthew 24, 14, when in that whole gospel, Jesus speaks about the signs of the end times. He says, and the gospel of the kingdom will be preached as a testimony to all nations. Then, then will come. Now, he didn't say maybe it will be preached suggestively, hopefully. Uh, it was a prophetic statement Jesus made saying the gospel of the kingdom will be preached. Therefore, you know, we know in Revelation, when John sees this unfolding truth, there is this great multitude in white robes, dressed in white robes, washed in the blood of the Lamb from every tribe, language, people, and nation. So I felt this was the assignment that he asked me to give my life for. And uh, in that vision, I saw many things, helicopter, multitudes. I didn't think that I would uh, uh, be speaking, but somehow it led me to America and led me to a number of adventures that, that, that really became defining for my life. So talk about what it was like for you then to, to go into a very remote you know, tribal area of, of Africa and to, to start encountering these people that, that you feel are part of your assignment. You know, I uh, still very young. When I went, when I went end on the mission field, and I connected, partnered with a group called Heli Mission. They had helicopters there, and we were. I was flying with them, and I was just kind of flying into the bush and knocking on every mission organization's door and every church door, and saying, "Let's go and reach <laughs> some unrich people." And I thought that that was what everyone wanted. Discovered that that was not as easy. It was maybe one of the reasons why, still two thousand years after Jesus gave the assignment, it's not finished. Mm. And over time, I, I ended up on this quest. Why is it that we have these tribes unreached? After 2,000 years, you have 2.4 some billion people. You have, uh, you have thousands of tribes. Now, depending on how you define what's unreached, but I had this encounter. Uh, 
that really, that really changed my life. Because for a while, every time we came to a place, they always responded. It always seemed like they were open when we came. We saw these extraordinary things happening. And it seemed like always the problem was what, in fact, Jesus is only referencing this thing to the harvest as a problem. Uh, lack of workers. He said, pray therefore to the Lord of the harvest, huh? Uh, that he will send forth workers. So it seemed like that was the only problem. So uh, I, I, didn't, I didn't understand this. And I, I, it really was an, an event that changed my life. But we were flying helicopter. And this is, uh, uh, we were serving at that time, even we're on rich tribes, bordering Sudan, southern Ethiopia. Uh, and, and this is geographically, uh, logistically, very, very challenging. Mm. So we're flying. Uh, this is kind of beginning of GPS even. So, you know, you're flying, really praying to the Holy Spirit to lead you. You know, that's kind of how we navigate. So we, <laughs> we felt like this is the place we need to land. So we're, we're landing in this village. And here is people coming from, um, you know, they don't have, obviously, even clothing the way we have it. So, so uh, they wonder what's come from the sky. Yeah. They run from everywhere. And I was with a professor even from Cornell. There was a few missionary uh, 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 friends. And as we land there, they run from everywhere. The kids are even kind of pinching my skin, wondering what's wrong with me. I'm, I'm, I'm looking sick. I'm so white. You yeah. know? So they're, we're sitting there. The way we used to use um, uh, to kind of approach tribes like that is what we call chronological storytelling. We tell God's story is one story. You can't just kind of tell the chapter in the middle of the book and mm -hmm. then they understand it or get it. We say God... They, they have no he, reference point for, no for, reference for, to point. start with. Yeah. So the gospel becomes a story yeah. and the whole Bible is the story. Right. So we say we want to leave someone that can tell God's story to you. So we only introduce them. We don't talk about Jesus that much first. We just want them to accept someone to come and share this story. Uh, but here's after we, we established no one has been there, we know that no one has shared the gospel with them. Uh, this tribal chief stand up in the back and he says through, through translations, what about Jesus Christ? He says, and I am, I'm, I'm surprised. We, we know, we were, we're, you know, no one has been there to tell them. So he starts sharing. He says, five days ago I had a dream. And he said, in this dream, this man come to me and they have this descriptive language. He said, he has shiny clothes. And this man in shiny clothes, he says, in five days people will come to you from the sky and you need to listen to their teaching. It will set you and your people free. Wow. And he said, this man in shiny clothes, I asked him, who are you? And, and he, he said, the shiny man, he said, he, he was Jesus Christ. Hmm. So I'm sitting here and I'm not always that emotional, but I'm getting kind of now a little bit emotional. I'm thinking because for me, Here's the, I know that Jesus doesn't have a time schedule, but the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords is somehow taking time out to share, to announce my coming. I understand it doesn't have anything to do with Carl, <laughs> but it, it, it becomes clear to me how much Jesus loves this tribes, this people right. that he shed his blood for and how important they are to him. Wow. To be able to hear once, to have one chance to hear the gospel of Jesus. That would also very clearly solidify the assignment that you've been given, knowing mm -hmm. that you're right in the center of God's will, because mm -hmm. you know He said you'd be there in five days. Yeah. Well, um, what you have so many stories that you could tell of uh, the experiences in these tribes. Mm -hmm. um, maybe a, another one that might come to mind. You know, as 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 we were, uh, as uh, this became kind of cornerstones, because I was wondering, you know, is this is this the heartbeat of Christ? And of course, some of those events, to me, always prove that this is the very core. You know, we talk about, and we live in some of the most poor. We've been, I've been living almost 20 years in Africa, and and some of this country's HIV AIDS is an enormous social uh, problem and we deal with poverty and issues that is important. And we talk about human rights. I even sit with some of the heads of states and we discuss uh, human right issues. But to me, the greatest human right violation is the idea that you have a people group or a tribe or a nation or a language somewhere that have since Christ died on the cross not had one chance, one opportunity uh, to hear the gospel and, and be presented with that. So uh, throughout the years, in fact, let me tell you this story. This is tremendous. Last week, I just came from Ethiopia now. I'm, 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 I haven't even been home yet. So on the way back, we were in uh, southeastern part of Ethiopia uh, towards Somali border. And we were flying helicopter. We had a team with us uh, filming. We did an outreach. Uh, but I was flying in some of those areas. And I met this man that I led to, to the Lord 12 years ago. Now, this story to me is extraordinary. Uh, this man, 
and, and I, I, you know, I, I was raised and I heard the power of the blood of Jesus and I heard a lot of things, but never kind of encountered witchcraft and the darkness you meet when you come into these tribes. But we were flying helicopter, reaching a tribe, and here comes, uh, in fact, as we were flying with some other missionaries to another outreach, I'm losing transmission oil pressure. Now, if you know anything about aviation, you know that then you're, you're going you're down. You're a pilot as well. You, you fly a helicopter. Right. Yeah. Now, and it, now, uh, now we have... At the helicopter, we're partnering with Hello Mission Ethiopia. They're piloted by a German pilot family and a Canadian family, kind of from this area, um, Andrew and, and Foster's. Anyhow, they're, they're great families. But it, at that time, I'm flying. So I'm losing transmission. This means, man, you're going down or you're... you're uh, <laughs> mm -hmm. um, um, so you want to land. We're landing there. And, uh, and I'm, I, we're stuck. The radio doesn't reach. No one knows where we're at. So we're stuck for several days. And we're, uh, I get this tropical infection in my leg, and I just don't understand what's happening. And eventually, uh, the Lord really kind of brings to our attention, I, I feel, we just plead the blood. You, just, you know, you are protected. We are marked by the blood of the Lamb. Meaning it's not only uh, that He will not judge us or pass us by in judgment, but also we're, we're marked as children of the Most High. Uh, so I'm, I'm, uh, I'm praying, and, and, and for some reason we find this mystical idea, th this plastic piece is plugged up the line. Anyhow, the helicopter were able to start it, fly back home, and, and, and this turns out that we lost three days, so I'm picking up the guide. We're going to the next outreach because I kind of lost days to be home. As we fly up and pick up this translator, he says, you can't believe the outreach we're going to have. We used to do this in different areas we target. And he says, we have, when we planned, targeted this stronghold where this witch doctor controls the whole mountain. Mount Horo was the name of this mountain. And there is a witch doctor, very powerful, they say. And they had slaughtered, when they heard we would come, uh, several cows, 20 cows or some more. They have these altars where they sacrifice to the spirit there. Mm -hmm. And they had prayed against us coming, saying if our God can stop them to come and this helicopter to come and speak about their God, then we will go and hear what they have to say. So they had challenged their God in front of the people. So I'm starting to kind of get why I've been having problems the whole week leading up to this. I'm flying up uh, as we land on this mountain. You could almost see on their face that they didn't expect us to come. So we're landing here and I don't even remember how many people were there, but it was a hillside of people, uh, thousands of people really. And as, as I'm just speaking to them about the blood of Jesus that, you know, it's not you sacrifice cows, but the reason I'm standing here is that I'm marked in the blood of Jesus, the blood of the Lamb. Uh, it's only pow that power in that, in that blood that is enough to save, forgive sins. And, and the first man that gets saved, that comes up, is the witch doctor in his house. And this is what I love many times. They're black and white. They're convinced. So he comes, me in my house. I've seen today there's only power in the blood of the Lamb, in the blood of Jesus. So he gets saved, and with him, thousands. I don't even remember. Now, this is what's interesting. Last week, I flew up, and I haven't seen him since. They told me now in this region on that mountain, every year, the day he got saved, it's a yearly celebration. People walk from all over this mountain. Now, hundreds of thousands of people around this mountain is saved. Churches is planted everywhere. And that witch doctor is not an evangelist, and he only has one message. There is only power in the blood of Jesus. Wow, what a transformation. Amazing, amazing. <laughs> 